Welcome to TFC Transplant Talk, where you'll find the most up-to-date information on topics that matter most to you and your loved ones. Join us in our engaging recorded interview series between transplant healthcare professionals and families living the transplant journey. We are your partners in transplant information, improving the lives of both the recipient and everyone around them. Well, Laura, I really appreciate you being um, willing to share your story today. Um, my understanding is that you've had a child who's, who's had been through a transplant, and we're going to kind of just have a conversation about that experience today, talk a, a little bit about what helped you, what you felt like you needed during that time, um, in hopes that it will help others. So would you just start by sharing a little bit about your journey and, and um, the transplant? Yes, uh, my son Ricky, he's had two heart transplants. His first, he was six months old. His second, he was eight years old. And uh, it, it's been, it's got good moments, bad moments. That's every, and I think everyone's journey is different. Even kiddos who've had the same type of transplant, everyone's individual journeys, but we have things in common. So when he was a baby, um, I think most of it, I, I guess as a parent, you know, you worry a lot. It was kind of really stressful because he was little. I didn't know he was my first child. So I was very nervous about everything. I asked a lot of questions. And any anytime something would come up, um, I was always scared. I was always scared because here, you know, my first child, I have no clue what's going on. Uh, we were in a small town by Corpus. So when he was five months old, um, I was in the hospital. We were always in the hospital. The most he had been home from three weeks on was maybe a month that he would be home. And home, I moved back to my mom's because I was scared of being by myself. My husband had to go to work, you know, so uh, we moved back with my mom. I was there and I'd go to the doctor every Wednesday, it was Wednesday clinic. I was at the doctor every Wednesday, every Wednesday, every Wednesday, and he would do well, and then he wouldn't do well. So we were on and off, on and off, until it was November, and it was almost, uh, it was Thanksgiving, um, and my brother had gone to buy a Christmas tree because he said, let's light up the Christmas tree at my mom's. And um, Ricky started turning blue. Mm. And I, I panicked, of course. My sister got on the phone, called 911, and we had the ambulance come over, took him to Corpus, to the hospital. And it, they kind of already knew us because we had been in and out of the hospital so many times. Sure. And we were in ICU, he was having congestive heart failure. And they said, you know, we're gonna have to transfer him because, you know, we can't do anything here anymore. Mm -hmm. So we got an airplane flew, uh, to Corpus, they flew us to San Antonio. And that's where the transplant process came about. Sweet. So we got, yeah, we got to San Antonio. Uh, he was five months old. It was kind of scary for me sure. because I didn't know anything. I mean, you know, I, I all I knew was like, but I did feel, this is, I don't know how it's going to sound, but I did feel like, oh, I'm finally somewhere where my son's going to get help because I felt as if the small, I don't know, the hospital it was a smaller hospital and they were just they were like, they didn't know what else to do for him. So when I arrived in San Antonio, I had that relief. It did feel like a big weight had come off my shoulders because I felt like, oh, wow, my son, I'm where I need to be. He's going to get help. They know what's going on. But about the transplant process, I, I didn't know anything. I mean, we didn't know. We didn't know what it was about. We didn't know. So we had to learn. We learned a lot. Uh, nurses were great. I, I always remember one of the nurses, and I still, I never forget that. She told me, um, you know, you know your baby. 
Nobody else knows your child. You know your child more than we do. So speak up, speak up, ask questions. Uh, don't be afraid. And then she said, and sometimes she said, the doctors forget they're talking to a parent. So they're gonna talk to you and in a language that you have no idea what's going on. She said, but you need to ask. Ask, and she said, tell them, speak to me in English. And, and I, I followed that advice. I still do sometimes. It was really important to get the information. Yes, yes, because I didn't, I mean, she was right, you know. And you had to and, understand it. Yeah. yeah, to understand it because we didn't know. We didn't know. And then, well, we were blessed. Ricky got his transplant, um, his first transplant, six months old. And that was scary too because you know, he was so sick. And then the doctor tells you, you know, I don't know if he's going to make it and we don't want you to be unprepared. So you need to make arrangements, you know, funeral arrangements for your child. So that was a hard thing to do. I mean, it was so hard that I didn't even tell my husband that I was told this, you know. Oh, wow. I picked up the phone, called my sister. And I told my sister, can you do this for me? And she said, okay, I'll do it for you. But at that moment, I didn't want to worry. My, my husband was working, trying to do, and I've said this a couple of times, several times probably, you know, as a parent, your world kind of stops. You, your world stops because your child's in the hospital and you have all these things going on, but the outside world keeps rolling. You know, everything keeps moving. Yes. You got to pay bills, you got to pay rent. And so he, that was his, I mean, that's what he was doing. He was out there working, trying to make ends meet because I was at home. You know, I was in the hospital with my, our son, so I had to stay home. And he would, and, then, and this is weird, or my, I don't know, we kind of talked to each other and he said, no, don't worry about it. Um, I'm going to work you are better at being at home. You know the medications, you know the doctors, you take them to the appointment. So I felt we, like we got into our roles. I felt like, okay. That's what I was thinking. It, that, that you all, but you all talked about it directly yes. and, and were clear with one another about who was gonna do what. Yes, yes, so we were in our role. I was the mom role and he was the, he was a provider, you know, working, working. I mean, sometimes, I mean, my husband's had a full-time job and like three part-time jobs, but that's kind of the roles we were in. And I mean, it also affects us as a couple sure. because, and there was a moment where I did tell my husband, you know, I am, a, I'm being a mom right now, so I can't be a wife also. And so the, that was one of the ways that the stress kind of impacted your family as well, is it, is it impacted your relationship with your husband and your ability to, to kind of be both a mom and a wife at the same time? Yes, yes. And the good thing is, and I even told him, I mean, it, it was so hard, right? So I told him, you know, if you if you cannot help me or or if you can't, I totally and I told him I totally understand if you can't be in our relationship. I said I understand if you need to move on with your life, you know, go make a fa like a family. But you know, because it happens, you're so stressed out. You have so many things going that couple time is really hard like it's very very hard uh and my husband told me no he's my baby too like he's my child too i mean this is a a, a team we have to do it together but i mean i we would i would see it in the hospital you know a lot of families would not it, just the trauma the stress being in the hospital it's a lot it's a lot of a lot to handle so you have different roles you're in, different things you have to take care of. And at that moment, we were just taking care of our child, you know, taking care of making sure he was okay, you know, making sure our baby was fine, was getting everything he needed. 
and um, just wanting to do what was right. And, and, and what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, throughout this process, you were, you were worried about a lot of things. You experienced anxiety in different ways. Um, you, you know, had everything really in your life turned upside down and you didn't always understand or know what was going on. And this really impacted you in every role in your life. It impacted you in, in your marriage and it impacted you as a young mother. Um, and I'm wondering, how did you take care of yourself or was that hard to do? Yes, that was really hard to do because that was kind of the last thing. It was always, I would, you know, take care of my son. He was like, number one, number two, my husband, make sure he had what he needed. He was always at work, make sure he had food, you know, and number three was me, which most of the time it was, I wasn't worried about me. You know, I wasn't worried about. You weren't even thinking about you. No. No, I wasn't even thinking about me at all, at all. So we went through the first transplant. Things were okay, okay. but he did start rejecting, you know? So, and, and the doctors told me, you know, it, it happens. It's normal to, for rejection, you know, to happen. So we went through that and then he did well. He started going to school. You know, he got to that age. He was in kinder. Oh, and we were told since he was a baby, don't, uh, don't send him to preschool. Well, this was back then, you know, it's been a while. Don't send him to preschool. He's immunosuppressed, right? So we waited till he was five and then they said, okay, let, he can start kinder. And he started kinder and that was hard because all this time, and it's just us three. I don't have any other kids, so it's just me, my husband, and my son. You know, it's just us. Yes, we would visit family, and family's out of town. So, but here in San Antonio, it was just us three all the time, all the time. So when Ricky started going to kinder, you know, he's a five-year-old, and I, I, you know, you don't think about it. I didn't think about it at the time. But the first two weeks, he he would get to school within an hour or so. They would call me and they would tell me, oh, he threw up. So I would go to school. You know, I would go to the school and I'd be like, okay, you know, does he have a fever? And the nurse is like, no, he doesn't have a fever. It seems to be okay, but we couldn't figure out why he was doing that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, I took him to his doctors. He got seen, everything, and they were like, no. I mean, health-wise, he seemed everything was okay. Thought, what could be what's going on right so the nurse at the school said you know what I think it's stress you know I think it's maybe he's but he's so little like how's he gonna tell us or how he doesn't and now I know like oh he was probably having anxiety he was anxiety, probably yeah he was probably stressed out but at that time we really didn't know we didn't know That's that's the thing about anxiety is it's it's hard to to know sometimes is, is this something that's medical or physical or is it is it really how anxious that I'm feeling yes so and now you know years later right but I stop and think you know I wish someone should could have said you know he's probably having anxiety he doesn't know uh, maybe you should take him to <laughs> <laughs> to get evaluated maybe you should you know but at that time we it's, didn't know it's hard to know as a young parent doing something that you've never done before and oftentimes it's um, the the access to mental health information and resources is very limited yes and that's exactly what happened and yeah after the two weeks he did he did well he was starting to learn how to be I guess with other kids because he had never been with other kids yeah that transition into kind of a new environment where you have to be away from in, in you know his case mom and dad probably for the first time it's very yeah. hard on kids yes yeah for the first time but then he, he did well he started doing well he went to kinder went to first grade then he he started getting well, he was starting to get tired 
the teacher would call me and say, you know, he does okay, but we've actually been letting him take naps at school. And I thought, oh, that's not a good sign. You know, I got to get him, make sure he's really physically okay. Mm -hmm. So I took him to his cardiologist. They did a heart cath. Uh, he was seven at this time. And that's when we were told that he actually had what they call transplant coronary artery disease. So the only thing he could have was to be listed for a second transplant. I just want to highlight something. So you really had to pay attention to everything that was going on with him and everything that the teachers were telling you. And, and you essentially picked up that there wasn't something right and, and, and took him in. I'm wondering how that was for you, uh, that you had to be that focused on, you know, all the details all the time. It was very stressful, tiring, but honestly, at that moment, I didn't feel it. I didn't, didn't feel it. I didn't feel it. I didn't realize it. That, I don't, I don't, I can't you had, even, you had, yeah. I'm sorry, you had, you had kind of alluded to that earlier. You don't really, when all of this is going on, you don't really think about yourself as a parent. You're just focused on your child and it's, it's, it's almost like, um, you know, you're not really tracking what's going on inside of you or what your needs may be or how it may be for you. Almost like you're in crisis mode all the time. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, stepping on, on pin needles or like on eggshells, like I let you are on it. You're always, and you're always focused on your child that you don't even realize what's going on with you because you just want to make sure that everything's okay. And I, that's the way I, I always was. And, and it also sounds like it, it was, you were doing this, but like you said earlier, the world continued moving. So there wasn't really a lot of, if I'm hearing you right, of other people that really understood kind of what life was like for you and what you were what you were going through. Is that accurate? Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, it's hard uh, because sometimes you know friends, family, they don't understand what your like your daily life and what you're doing. It it just doesn't happen now because. I was part of Transplants for Children. When we were in the hospital, we were introduced to Transplants for Children. And that's where I got to meet other moms of transplant patients. Now, those moms were my relief. You know, they still are to this day because- You found a tribe. Yes, yes. They are, we would have parent meetings uh, and we get together and we talk about, okay, what medicine is your child on? What are you taking? Are you taking care of yourself? What do y'all do? Everybody, that was like oh, a huge relief because I felt like, oh, they understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they cared about you too, not, yes. not just how your, your son was doing, but they were checking in that you were doing okay. Yes, yes. And it, it makes, it still makes a big difference. You know, Ricky's now an adult and it still makes a big difference. And those moms are still, we still keep in contact. We're still together and we still help each other. So that makes a big difference. Um, and then, well, it's really when, important that you weren't going through that experience completely alone. Yes, yes, it was. And when we were told he needed the second transplant, um, it was kind of hard because they stopped doing them in San Antonio. So we had to move to Houston. Oh, so wow. once again, it, we kind of like picked up, moved. Um, we were sent for a doctor's appointment um, to get you know, checked for the second transplant. And we go to the appointment and the doctor tells us, I'm sorry, I can't let you go home. And we're like, what you know we were just coming for the evaluation and they said oh no you know he's really sick you have to stay in the hospital so we can list him and you'll have to remain in the hospital while he waits for a possible second one so we, I had like we went with a set of clothes because we were going home you know we we're just going for the evaluation my husband had to leave and he said I'll be back I'll go get y'all's clothes and don't worry, you know? And we just said, okay, you know, we have to do what we have to do. We can't 
you know, we just said, okay, that, that's what we need to do. We need to stay here. We'll do it. Yeah. So we were in the hospital. And, and what it highlights is, you know, you have to be essentially ready for the unexpected at just about any time. And so you're paying attention to details and at really any appointment, something could change drastically that could um, really turn your life in some ways upside down. You had to move from San Antonio to Houston without any preparation or, um, you know, any kind of uh, uh, heads up. It, did I understand that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Nothing. We, it was just, we kind of let you, the doctor said, I don't feel comfortable letting you go. He's just not in the condition to be at home. He needs to be in the hospital with the medication he has to, for us monitoring him. He needs to stay here. And yet, you know, here you go. Your world gets flipped upside down. You have no one in Houston. I had nobody in Houston. You have no one in Houston. You leave everyone and we were in the hospital the whole time. That meant we were not allowed to leave that hospital floor. We could not even go outside it, it, because he was listed for the transplant and they didn't want him to be exposed to anyone who was sick. So he was had to stay, he had to stay. So we get sheltered, we get sheltered in, we can only stay on the floor. He was allowed to walk around his floor, you know, rock around the floor. They had a little playroom, but I mean, we were like this. We got there in June. We were like that. He, we were blessed to get the transplant in November, but all those months we were like inside, no outside. We had family, friends come visit, but it was very limited too because they wanted to make sure no one would expose him to anything and he wouldn't get sick. Because wow. if he were to get sick, he would automatically get taken off the list. So what that means is that he and you had limited support even from family during yeah. those times. Yes, yes, and it, it, it was really hard. So we were blessed, he got his transplant um, and the doctors, everything went well. And they said, okay, we can let you, it was in November right before Thanksgiving. And the doctor said, we can let you go, but we don't want you to go home because mm. he's gonna have to have routine. Like every three months he was having a hard cath. He was having doctor's appointments in between. He was having labs. We needed to make sure his medication levels were well. So they said, we'll let you go to the Ronald McDonald home, but we need you to stay in Houston. So we did. And when we did, I was, I remember my, my brother and my sister had come for a visit and we were there and they said, well, let's go to the mall. You know, I hadn't been out. I hadn't gone. In. So they were like, let's go me. And they just wanted to take me right to get me out. And I was like, okay, I, I thought, okay, fine. I got sick. I got, we got to the mall. We are in the mall. And all of a sudden, I just, I think it was so many people and all the, no, I don't know, but I actually, my stomach got sick. I felt so nauseated. I, I, and I said, we need to go home. We need to go. And they said, no, no, no. They, they saw like, I guess that I just yeah. got sick. I got sick. What do you make of that now? Now, I think it was the anxiety and the stress that I had been inside the hospital for so long, you know, yes, there's a little bit of noise, but nothing like a crowd in the mall during Thanksgiving, you know, it was the holidays. It was so many people. So now I know, yeah, it was, it was an anxiety. I think it probably was having like an anxiety attack or something. You, know, it, you, you had been for so long in the environment and so focused on your son that you hadn't done anything for yourself or, or even gotten out. And so I can imagine that there were a lot of, um, of very uh, anxiety inducing experiences of just going to the mall. I don't know if you were worried about your son because you were away from him. I don't know if you were, um, if just all of the people, like you said, it was just an overwhelming experience. Yes, yes, it was very overwhelming. So we came back 
I did well, but I also noticed now, you know, when I didn't then, but my son kind of was going through the same thing when we were at the Ronald McDonald home. He at first um, would have a hard time leaving the room at the Ronald McDonald house. They had a little, they had a playroom, you know, they had a game room. So he kind of had, he would have a difficult time um, playing with the I'm other leaving. two. Yes, yes, it was. Right, we um, we and, froze there for a minute. Sorry. I, I was asking, he was having a, a difficult time leaving the room. Yes, yes. And just going to the playroom, um, he wouldn't go if I wasn't there or if my husband wasn't there. And the other little kids, they they would all get, like, they would get together and they would be playing. But he had uh, uh, a little girl there that she kind of friended him. And she kind of got him out of his shell. It was it was really helpful because she got him out of his shell. She would come knock on the room door and say, Ricky, let's go play. So then she kind of started taking him to the game room. She started taking, so then he kind of got out of his little, but he and I think he was probably going through a lot of things. He just didn't know how to say it. Yeah. And that's what's so hard with kids. They don't have the words to describe what's going on with them. But on some level, he was experiencing um, the things that you've been describing as well, in the sense that life changed unexpectedly, and he wasn't able to, to transition back to, to even a what we might think of as a regular event, playing with other kids. But that was hard. Yes, like yes. It was hard to go to the mall, you know? Yes, for me. So... Yeah. Now I I always think God, I wish that it, if any mom notices like me that I notice those things that that they take that step because I feel that he should have had a therapist he should have had a someone helping him with all those mental things that were going on we had all the doctors for you know his heart his lungs his everything else but we really didn't have anyone to help him with and yes he was eight he was young and to help the family yes because you you've highlighted that this this impacted everyone including you and your husband and oftentimes kids need to know that their parents are, are okay or feel that they're doing okay in order to be okay themselves yes yes see that would have been a big help and if that would have been started since then, it would have been so much easier. I Now I see that. Now I see that. Where I mean as, okay, yes, he was eight. And, and then he started doing better. He started doing better. Uh, we actually moved into an apartment. And we were in Houston because we were still there. We stayed in Houston three years. Three wow. years. And that was hard. So an to unexpected appointment you know led to three years of a of your life being in a different city in a different city no wow. one there no contact i i didn't have my transplants for children family with me because they were in san antonio so i it was really difficult uh, after three years where he doctors had said you know all everything was okay his rejection was under control he had zero you know his score was a zero which meant he was excellent yeah. we got that score and me and my husband sat down and we were like we're so ready to go to san antonio we were ready to come home you know to come to san antonio and come home and my husband said okay i've been waiting to he wanted a his job had transferred him temporarily to houston but he was ready to come to san antonio yeah. to come back so he contacted his uh supervisors in san antonio and said i'm ready to go back so we, we we moved back we were so ready to come back we missed being in san antonio we missed our our friends here my tribe my transplants for children tribe yes i missed having them i missed those moms because they knew how i felt they knew what they understood what I was going through. Yeah. And it's true, like you said, it affects the whole family because 
and now I realize it because when I sit down with my sister, you know, and we talk about things, she says it if everything that you all, that me and my son and my husband went through, she said we were affected too. You know, my sister, my mother, my dad, my in-law, everybody. She said everybody gets affected. And at that time, we don't think about it. You know, we don't think about those things. But she's like, yes, like for my sister, she says, for me, I always wanted to be there for you. She says, but I couldn't. There was things that I had going on with my family. She says, and then I felt like, golly, I can't even be there to support her, you know? So it's crazy, but every the whole family gets affected, yes. everyone. You know, I, I'm, I'm so appreciative of you sharing your story so clearly. Um, and there, there are a couple key things that really stand out to me when I hear you talk, when I think about mental health. One is that you as, as a caregiver and as a parent, you, you, you weren't thinking about yourself. You weren't taking care of yourself. You weren't, you weren't addressing your own needs. And you were really in sort of a, a crisis or a survival mode for years. Um, and, you know, I know that you can look back now and say, I was worried, I was anxious, um, but I'm not sure if you have advice for people who may be going through what you were going through about how to care for themselves, how to, or um, why it's important to, to step back and think about your own needs. Any thoughts at all for, for those that may be in that spot now? Yes, yes. Um, like for me, like I, like I never worried about it. Well, it got to where we, we were already living here in San Antonio. So I, I ended up in the emergency room because I thought I was having a heart attack. My heart rate was high. My blood pressure was high. I felt awful and I get there, you know, the doctor see me and really and truly I had nothing. I mean, I was well, you know, thank goodness everything was okay. But that was the first time that the doctor in the emergency room, he gave me an Ativan. He says, you need to relax. He says, you are probably have a lot of anxiety. And he asked me, where do you work? What do you do? And I said, well, I, I'm going to stay at home. My son's a transplant patient. And he said, oh, yes, you are really in a stressful, you live a stressful life. He said, you really need to take care of yourself. Your body is telling you, your body. And, and I told him, I said, well, in my mind, I don't, I don't feel like I'm stressed out or I don't feel. And he said, no, your body's telling you, you are stressed out. He says, that's why you are here. And I hadn't heard that. I had not heard that. It's a great way to say it. And, and one of the things that that highlights is as a caregiver, if you do not care for yourself, you will not be able to care for your, your child in a way that you want to. And you really hit a point where you didn't have any more to give. You ran out of gas. Yes. Your, body, your body gave you those signals. Yes, that's exactly what happened to me. So, I mean, from then on, I had to learn. And it was a learning process because when you've been doing this, I mean, I've been doing it for so long, I, I had to learn to you know, take it slow, take it easy, try not to, really, you know, stress so much and just take one day at a time, just one day. Because I used to be like, okay, what well, tomorrow or next month is his doctor's appointment. And I was already stressing over, you know, his appointment and it's not till next month. I had to learn to, it's not till next present. month. Yes, live right now, take care of today, today. But I also had to learn to, I, like my son, I was very, uh, when he was little, you know, my parents or my in-laws would, you know, leave him here. Like you, you can go or you know, go do whatever, go shop, go get out. You had and, to be able to be away from him. Yes. I had to learn that it was okay, that it was okay. But I, this is my sound crazy, but I used to think if something happens to him 
and I'm not there, say my mother or my mother-in-law who was taking care of him and something would happen, how were they going to be okay? I wouldn't worry about what was going to happen or if something would come. I would be worried about, is my mom going to be okay? Is she going to be able to, to handle whatever happens if I'm not here? I used to think I, that, you, were, you were carrying a lot of responsibility, and it sounds like also really felt in some ways afraid and even guilty for taking time for yourself. Yes, yes, I would. I would. Or, or if I would do it, like if I would go do my nails or go cut my hair, I would be, you know, feeling guilty because I took that time. You took that time to myself. But it's not, that's what I want, you know, moms to know, you need that time. You need that time to- It's as critical as caring for your, your child as you being with your child. If you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to do what you need to do for your child. Yes, exactly. It kind of refreshes you. You get out, you do a little bit for yourself, it refreshes you and you come back even stronger. You know, it's uh, two things come into my mind. The analogy that people usually use is like when you get on an airplane, they always tell you in the event of a problem, you have to put on your own oxygen mask first, right? Because if you don't have your own oxygen mask on and you're trying to help others, ultimately you're going to end up passing out, right? And so you have to make sure that you have your own needs met in order to help others. Also think about it in kind of like the way we just talked about it. you got to have gas in your car to continue driving you know yes. you make it without fuel and what you're describing is getting your nails done doing you know getting your hair done going um, out and being with friends or just getting out and having some alone time but all of that is kind of like fuel that refreshes you so that you can come back and, and care for your, your, your child yes Yes, that's exactly true. And it's very important. And I know some moms out there, they, they don't have that or they don't, they need to make the time to have that. Even if it's, you know, just going to do your nails or going to drive. And I know right now it's really hard with the COVID, you know, with all this going on, but you can still go out there, drive around, go drive around, go, drive, go to the park, take a walk, take a walk, just yourself. Because you need you it. Be, you need it, and you got to be intentional about it. And sometimes maybe even you've got to make yourself do it. And I think part of what you're trying to do is encourage um, caregivers to do this, but also to say, this is permission to do this. Yes, it's permission. It's okay. It's okay to do it. Yeah, because like I used to have that guilt. It's it's okay it's okay to do that for yourself. It's very important. Another thing that I heard you talk about that really sounded critical in sustaining you and helping you cope with the anxiety and all of the stress was this tribe. Yeah. And so there's, um, there's the need to feel understood, to share your experience with others who can understand also to have some degree of support, but that was really um, a lifeline for you that helped yes. you cope. Yes, it is. It is. And um, and it's okay to reach out because I know I would call some of those moms, you know, or I, you know, I would call and I'd be like, what do you do? What do you do when uh, the medication level's too high or uh, has he taken this antibiotic or has your child taken it? I would reach out. I would reach out to those moms, and I was so blessed that those moms would be like, oh, it's okay. You know, don't worry. We've given it to them. Or, yes, my child's been on it. Or the medication, like sometimes his medications levels for his transplant meds were like really high. And they would be like, oh, don't worry. You know, ours was too, and he's fine. You know, they're fine. Don't worry about it. I remember one time uh, I had. I thought my husband had given him the medication. He thought I had given it and we gave him, we both gave him, you know, so we double dosed him. So we were like, oh my gosh, you know, we just double dosed our child, you know? And I was like, ah, you know, and I called the doctor's office and it was after hours and 
I was so worried. So here I get, I start calling my moms, you know, oh my gosh, we double dosed them. What do we do? And they're like, it's okay. Relax, you know, relax. Just don't give them the morning dose. It's going to all be okay. You know, uh, don't worry. It happens to all of us. So all that is really important. And it's okay to reach out, you know, don't feel bad about reaching out because it is okay. And, the, you know, we're there for that. It, it's okay to reach out and ask for help, but it's also essential to not go through this journey alone. Exactly. We're not alone. There's several of us out there. there and like I said, everyone's journey is different, but we have so much in common that we understand each other and it's okay it's okay to do it, you know? And as he was getting older, he had his second transplant, things were going well, we came home, but you know, there comes to when they hit 13 years, woo, that's a, <laughs> that's a challenge. I think with any, anybody, like any kids who don't have problems and kids who have- with that would take at least an hour in itself to talk about everything yes. then, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. they go through their 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 teen things, they go through being sick, they go through feeling not, you know, wanting to feel included, they go through uh, high school. And like in our situation, Ricky had gotten sick. Um, so he missed out. He got to go to his freshman year. He missed out his sophomore, junior year. His senior year came around and I pretty much told the doctor, can he please have his senior year? Like, can you please let him go? Cause he was getting homeschooled cause he had gotten a really bad rejection and they wiped out his immune system. So they did not want him around. You know, and so his senior year came and I was like, can you please let him have senior year? Like at least have senior year. Well, because he had been out all this time, he was having a hard time because, you know, I've been out, I'm stuck at home, couldn't go anywhere, didn't have the friends, you know, and hard for him to make friends. So it, it's hard for you as a parent to see your child. I'm sure, I'm sure, yeah. To see him struggling and uh, feel helpless in some ways. I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of advocating for him, but in some ways, you know that you can only do so much. Yes, yes. So it, it's, it, it's hard. It's hard to get that. It's hard to go through all that. But again, you know, when we would have these meetings uh, at Transplants for Children, he was at, at a point where he was like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go anymore. I don't want to. You know, he's growing up. He thinks he's getting older. Yeah, they go through that stage. But I would tell him, it was it was funny. I would say, okay, I know you don't want to go, but it's my turn. I need to be there. I need to see my moms. I need to talk. I need... At that point, you knew that you needed it. Yes, yes. So I, I would tell him and he'd be like, okay, you know, okay. And then we'd go and he'd end up having a great time because he would see his transplant buddies and his transplant friends were there so he had them too you know and he, and he got that sense of belonging sense of connection and that sense of feeling understood from transplant plants for children's group as well yes you know that's that's so so key because as we've spent you know really today talking about the caregiver the caregiver's needs obviously there's a whole nother angle which has to do with the, your, your child and your child's needs and how you help them as they're developing just like any other child but have kind of um, all of this uncertainty and these unique stressors on them as well. I wanted to highlight one other thing that you've said today that seems really critical for caregivers to know um, and I think you probably have some advice here as well and it has to do with making sure that you're taking care of, of or I shouldn't say taking care of, um, in some ways that you're also focused on your other relationships in the family, not just the relationship with your, your child who's going through this, but also um, your relationship with your spouse. You, you and your husband, it sounds like, did a very good job at clarifying roles and being clear about who was doing what, and it sounds like you were talking about it throughout. 
but also it sounds like it reaching out to extended family and trying to establish some you know understanding with them and get whatever support is available through your extended family that that's that's an important piece of it as well i didn't know if there was anything there that you'd want to highlight um, as, as well yes yes um it, it is important because there's times where I, I used to think, oh, no, well, I, I can't, you know, tell my sister or tell my mom to do this for me because, you know, I don't want them to worry about if something happens or, or, or I don't want my mother-in-law to worry about it or, you know, you're so worried about everybody else, but honestly and truly, they want to help. They want to be there for you. It's okay. It's okay to reach out and tell your mother-in-law, you know, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Your mom, your sisters, they all want to be there. It's just kind of you, me, like me as a mom. Oh, no, I was like wanting to make sure that everybody was okay. You know, I was trying to keep everybody. But at the same time, uh, I didn't realize that they were there 100%. They wanted to be there for me. And they, they're there to help. They're there to help also. So it is okay to reach out. It's okay. You know, it's not, it's not going to hurt them. And they, they can understand. Uh, like I, I would tell my sister, okay, look, this is what's going on. This is, this is how I feel. This is what, so she'd be like, no, it's okay. I, I, I'm here for you. I might not understand at all, but I'm here to listen. And that's so important to help you cope in the end. As, as the primary caregiver, that kind of support, particularly from family, is, is really essential. Yes. Listen, I, I really want to thank you so much for sharing with us today. And, and I want to make one other comment. You've, you've given, you know, I think such a clear picture of, of what, what part of this was like for you and really highlighted the need to focus on mental health for the caregiver. Yes. You're, you're doing something right now that I is very mentally healthy. You're, you're, you're sharing your story and you're, you're, you're helping others. And, and sometimes that in itself is, 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 is very helpful for us to know that, that, that whatever hardship we've been through, whatever um, pain or suffering that we've experienced, that if we can somehow help others um, in that process, that it, it, it helps us as well. And so I really appreciate you being so open and willing to share with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I completely have always say if I can help one mother, one father, one family and uh, not have all these questions or just help them get it better or do better. That helps me. I feel good about that. Well, I imagine that, that what you shared today is going to help um, many, many parents. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. For being <laughs>